Welcome to Wither the Court. It's actually our 10th anniversary of Wither the Court. Um, and my name is Brad Sears. I'm the Roberta A. Conroy Scholar and Executive Director of the Williams Institute and the Assistant Dean of Academic Programs and Centers at UCLA School of Law. Uh, we have a fantastic discussion uh, lined up for you tonight on equality under the Roberts Court. Uh, Fisher, Shelby, Windsor, Perry, Perry and Baby Veronica. Um, and uh, since we have a full discussion, we're going to jump uh, right into it, but I want to say a few thank yous before we start. Uh, first, although she's probably out in the hallway, still hard at work, I want to thank Kathy Mayorkas, who helped me organize uh, the first Wither the Court uh, 10 years ago. She's Executive Director of Public Interest Programs at UCLA School of Law, so Kathy, wherever you are. And then the people who helped uh, put everything up tonight, Hamid and Randy and Adeline and Catherine and the others uh, that you met outside. So thank you for putting the show together. A very important person uh, for all of us tonight is Gregory Davis, who uh, has the great job of keeping us all on track uh, with his time cards. Um, <laughs> Uh, but he can do much more than tell time. Uh, Gregory is a 3L at UCLA School of Law. Um, he, we had the pleasure of working with him this summer as a Gleason Kettle Fellow at the Williams Institute. And he recently won um, a highly competitive uh, national scholarship, the 2013 Voices on Point Scholar is Gregory Davis. So thank you, Gregory. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to start now with a practice that I'm going to continue throughout the evening, which is being very short when introducing people, uh, but I want us all to give a very special welcome to the Dean of UCLA School of Law and the Michael J. Connell Distinguished Professor of Law, uh, Dean Rachel Moran. Well, thank you, Brad, and good evening, everyone. On behalf of the UCLA School of Law, I would like to welcome everyone to this, the 10th anniversary of Wither the Court, our annual review of the Supreme Court's prior term and a preview of what the current term may hold. I would also like to give a special welcome to our incoming first year students, some of whom I saw here earlier, as well as our UCLA Law alumni, some of whom I also saw earlier. Thank you all for being here. In 2003, Wither the Court began. It was the brainchild of Kathy Mayorkas from the Epstein Public Interest Law and Policy Program and Brad Sears from the Williams Institute on Sexual Orientation Law and Policy. And since then, this program has evolved into a school-wide tradition for launching the academic year. And it's also become one of our law school's biggest events. In fact, it was so big this year that we had to leave the law school to make room for everyone. Now, Wither the Court is a showcase for the depth and the breadth of the intellectual community that makes up UCLA School of Law. It's really a testament to the impact that our students, faculty, and academic programs have on the development of law and policy, and through those developments on the lives of real people. The speakers in tonight's program highlight just some of the academic centers that are critical incubators of our intellectual life here. These centers enrich our offerings to students through specializations and academic events. They support the scholarship of faculty and ensure its dissemination beyond the academy. And they facilitate the cross-pollination of ideas and expertise across the UCLA campus through interdisciplinary research that informs the most pressing issues of the day. To be more specific, the speakers tonight represent the following programs and centers at UCLA School of Law. Uh, through Kathy Mayorkas, who helped organize the event, the David J. Epstein Program in Public Interest Law and Policy. The Epstein Program is one of the nation's top public interest law programs, and it prepares students to engage in advocacy on behalf of traditionally underrepresented clients and interests. Its faculty offer unparalleled experience as public interest advocates and distinguished scholars and teachers. Through panelist Angela Riley, a professor here at the law school, she represents the Native Nations Law and Policy Center. The center supports Native Nations by enhancing their governmental institutions and laws, strengthening their cultural resource protections, 
and addressing critical public policy issues by bringing together our scholars and tribal leaders and knowledge holders. Through panelists, Professor Kimberly Crenshaw and Cheryl Harris, the Critical Race Studies Program. The Critical Race Studies Program is a training ground for a new generation of practitioners, scholars, and advocates committed to racial justice theory and practice. It's anchored by renowned scholars like Professors Crenshaw and Harris, and it truly has no parallel in American legal education. It remains the first and only program of its kind. And finally, through tonight's moderator, Brad Sears, and through panelists Doug Najem and Adam Winkler, the Williams Institute. The Williams Institute is a national think tank that is dedicated to research and scholarship in the field of sexual orientation and gender identity law and public policy. It now has over 20 scholars and fellows, and it too has no parallel in American legal education. It also is the first and only program of its kind. Now Brad is going to provide additional introductions to tonight's panelists, but I want to just mention a few ways that these individuals, academic centers, all represent at the law school ways that we have an impact on the cases you're about to hear about tonight. In February 2013, just two months before oral argument in the Baby Veronica case, Angela Riley was invited to the Supreme Court to give a lecture on the history of Native Americans and the court. She gave the lecture from inside the courtroom after being introduced by Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and her lecture was televised by C-SPAN. This was an incredible honor for Professor Riley and also an amazing opportunity to provide the court with historical context for the Baby Veronica case. I also wanted to mention that under the supervision of Professor Stuart Banner, students in UCLA School of Law Supreme Court Clinic filed amicus briefs in both the Baby Veronica and Fisher versus Texas cases. And for Baby Veronica, they actually prepared a brief on behalf of 53 professors of Indian law, recounting the historical background of the Indian Child Welfare Act to demonstrate its relevance to claims by non-custodial parents. And for the Fisher case on affirmative action in higher education, the students drafted an amicus brief on behalf of 96 experimental psychologists that demonstrated that standardized tests and other measures of academic performance systematically underestimate the talents of members of underrepresented minority groups. And finally, Brad and other Williams Institute scholars submitted three amicus briefs in the Windsor and Perry cases, the Defense of Marriage Act case and the case involving gay marriage that came out of California. In addition, and I think perhaps even more indicative of the Institute's centrality to these issues is the fact that over one-third, one-third of the hundred briefs that were filed in those two cases cited research done by the Williams Institute and its scholars. And in fact, it was Williams Institute research that provided the empirical basis for one of the most moving moments during oral argument when Justice Kennedy stated that, and I quote, the voices of the 40,000 children being raised by same-sex couples in California also deserved to be heard. So that's really what UCLA School of Law is all about. Critical thinking, rigorous interdisciplinary research, and educating students and key decision makers to make a real difference in the lives of real people. So tonight you're going to hear inquiries that really are the kind that we at UCLA Law engage year round in our classrooms and through our scholarships. But they are also questions that you as members of diverse communities must consider for yourselves. And so what I hope is that tonight's discussion will inform this debate and that you will come away with a richer understanding of the issues that shape our nation and our community here at UCLA Law. And we hope that these answers will lead the way to the highest and richest understanding of the evolving promise of equality for all. And finally tonight, I am particularly pleased that upon its 10th anniversary, all that Wither the Court offers has been recognized by one of our alumni, Cindy LeBeau, through a special fund in honor of her husband, 
We thank you, Cindy, for your generosity, which will allow us to continue the excellent tradition of Wither the Court into its second decade. And to introduce the gift and Cindy is one of Cindy's closest friends, our own UCLA School of Law Dean of Students, Liz Cheadle. Thank you, Rachel. Cindy and Alan Lebo, both double Bruins, were college and law school sweethearts. They married after Cindy's first and Alan's second year at UCLA Law. For their honeymoon, they drove to Washington, D.C. to participate in the school's brand new full-time externship program. <clears throat> Alan worked with and forged strong connections to the renowned nonprofit Center for Law and Social Policy. I met Alan and Cindy when Cindy was an associate and I was a paralegal at Manat Phelps and Rothenberg, and we all became pals. Alan and Cindy were two of the people who strongly encouraged me to apply to law school and specifically to attend UCLA. Alan was a golden boy, a rising star at Wyman Bowser, and a wonderful mentor and role model. Cheadle, he said, you can do it. An entire generation of UCLA law grads and West Side lawyers all remember precisely where we were on September 25th, 1978, when we learned that Allen was among the 144 people killed in what was, at the time, the deadliest air crash in US history at Lindbergh Field in San Diego. I was on the front steps of the law school, having just left Steve Azell's civil procedure class. Things have never been quite the same for anyone who knew and loved Allen, and everyone who knew him did love him. Memorial funds were raised at the time and set aside for the right moment. In the 35 years since Alan's death, Cindy's had a remarkable career. She left Los Angeles within three months of the accident to live in Washington, D.C., and serve as chief counsel to Senate Majority Leader Robert C. Byrd. She then became general counsel to the Senate Judiciary Committee, where she prepared then Senator Joe Biden for judicial confirmation hearings including those for Chief Justice William Rehnquist when he was elevated to chief, Justice Antonin Scalia, unsuccessful Supreme Court nominee Robert Bork, and Justice Anthony Kennedy. Later, she established the legislative practice in DC for Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher and served as senior counsel for the Justice Department. Although she lived in DC for 22 years, Cindy maintained close ties here in Los Angeles. She ultimately returned here full-time in 2000 to be associate director for the Rand Institute for Civil Justice. Now back at UCLA in her fourth year as an adjunct faculty member in the political science department, Cindy teaches constitutional and public law classes to hundreds of undergraduates every year. And she's become a major fan and now financial supporter through Allen's Memorial Fund of Wither the Court. So it's my pleasure to introduce my friend, Cindy Lebo. Thank you, Liz, for those lovely remarks. This is a dedication that is long overdue, but some things are worth waiting for. I am so proud that my husband's all too brief life and career will be memorialized by supporting one of the law school's premier programs, the annual Supreme Court Review, known as Wither the Court. For many years, with a modest fund, I searched for just the right way to commemorate Alan's life, something special and individualized that would reflect the interests and the character of this extraordinary person, as well as our early journey together. Various deans and professors, most particularly Dean Susan Prager, suggested several possibilities, but either there was not quite enough money in our fund or the suggested program just didn't seem right. But a couple of weeks ago, as I was searching the UCLA event calendar for this program, because I always attend, it came to me. One of UCLA's signature programs had never been supported or underwritten by the alumni or any other sponsors. It was indeed the perfect fit, just the perfect merger of interests, legacy, and goals. I am so grateful to my friend Liz Cheadle, to Brad Sears, and of course to Dean Moran for making this happen 
and making it happen so quickly in just a couple of weeks that it could be announced this evening. This is going to sound so old fashioned standing here in, in 2013, but in the early 1970s, Alan and I were one of the first UCLA law couples. We met while we were undergraduates at Weyburn Hall. That's the building that's now next door to Target that was one of the first privately owned co-owned door, co-ed dorms in the country. You can imagine what my mother thought about that. <laughs> then we moved to La Mancha, which is now the W Hotel. We got married after my first year and Alan's second year of law school and honeymooned for five months in Washington, where we both completed internships at two different public interest law firms, traveling all over the East Coast while we had the chance. We returned to Los Angeles and upon graduation, Alan joined the prestigious law firm of Wyman, Boutzer, Rothman, and Kekel, then, as I'm sure many of you remember, an LA legal and political powerhouse whose partners included the national finance chair of the Democratic Party and a former Republican senator. He practiced corporate and bankruptcy law and tried his hand at litigation. In everything he did, Alan was a star. I actually keep the shiny gold star that the firm gave him when he became a partner in less than five years on my desk. When I graduated a year later, I joined Loeb and Loeb, and then a couple of years later moved to Manette, Phelps, and Phillips. It seemed like we had the world at our feet. Two substantial incomes for that time, and everything and anything seemed possible. We worked together on the first presidential campaign of then Governor Jerry Brown. And our two best friends, Mickey and Valerie Cantor, introduced us to a couple from Arkansas who they believed would one day become President of the United States. That was Bill and Hillary Clinton. We were young, we were active in the state bar, we were in the LA County Bar, we were involved in California politics. We were part of the next generation of leaders in Los Angeles. Everything seemed set. We had played by the rules, worked hard, and continued success seemed inevitable until the morning of September 25th, 1978. Just to take an extra moment because these are some memories worth, worth telling. That morning, Alan said, let's have tacos for dinner. He played with our adorable new puppy and drove off to catch a flight to LAX to fly to San Diego. At the time, because of a case he was working on, he took the 8.30 flight to San Diego three to four times a week like he was taking the bus. But this time, within an hour, he had disappeared from the face of the earth. Along with 134 other passengers on the plane and seven bystanders on the ground. I've never been able to reconcile why the most terrible things can happen to the very best people. But from the moment that I heard on the car radio that a PSA plane had crashed approaching the San Diego airport, I knew my life would never be the same. It is odd to, st to say, standing here, recounting these events, that as time went on, as Liz so graciously mentioned, I had some extraordinarily good luck and some major accomplishments on my own. But as one of our close law school friends wrote me just the other day, it's hard not to wonder how the lives of all of us and our community would have been better if Alan was still here. His memory will always be cherished. I want to say something especially to the many students who are here to attend tonight's program. For a few of us of a certain generation, this is a poignant moment to remember an admired friend and colleague, but not for the reasons you might think. Yes, Alan Lebo was a outstanding law student, a talented and successful lawyer a community leader committed to several public interest causes. But he was something much more. Beyond his many professional accomplishments, he is most especially remembered for his kindness, his humor, 
his humility, and generosity of spirit. He proved that you could indeed be a high-powered lawyer, yet remain a truly decent and honorable man. He counseled the most senior partners in his law firm and the most sophisticated clients, but he still had time to help the office janitors with their family troubles. He always had a kind word for the waitress or his secretary or the gardener or the neighbors and even, yes, time for his mother. He was both a successful, as we say today, big law lawyer and at the same time the very best person that a person could ever be. In a short time, he lived the kind of life that everyone who remembers him says, because I knew you, as the beautiful song goes, I have been changed for good. That is the highest calling of every lawyer and truly an example for all of us. It is why this outstanding program is and will be such a fitting tribute to one of UCLA's finest graduates. Thank you so much and thank you for coming. Um, I think we're all very honored to have Wither the Court um, honored in this way by Cindy and Alan. Um, so tonight, we're going to explore the Roberts Court's understanding and development of equality under the U.S. Constitution. Uh, we might have also entitled tonight's discussion, Three Days in June. On, on Monday, June 24th, the court decided Fisher versus University of Texas, declaring it was going to give very strict scrutiny to use of race in admissions for higher ed education. Although not part of our formal case list tonight, on that same day, it issued two other opinions uh, narrowing the protections offered by Title VII for employment discrimination. Uh, not great, but could have been worse. Tuesday, June 25th, it got worse. Uh, the court issued decisions in Adoptive Couple versus Baby Girl and Shelby County versus Holder. In the first case, the court gives a narrow statutory reading of a federal law passed to protect Native American children being taken away from their families and their tribes with a heavy hint that the statute would raise equal protection concerns if it had, it had construed it otherwise. That same day in Shelby, the court gutted one of the core protections of the Voting Rights Act. And then came Wednesday, June 26. Uh, taking its cue from any good Hollywood romance, Victorian novel, or a fashion show, the court ends with the wedding. <laughs> On Wednesday, it declared the Defense of Marriage Act unconstitutional in U.S. versus Windsor, and through its decision in Hollingsworth versus Perry, uh, paved the way to weddings for gay couples that actually begin a few days later on Friday. It was quite a ride, and for many of us, the week was better, bittersweet. Uh, no case is an island, and these are not separate opinions uh, impacting separate groups of people. Many are caught in the cross currents, and they come from one court interpreting one constitution. Although perhaps not equally, they do impact us all. To discuss uh, equality in the Robert Courts, you really couldn't get a better panel than this. Uh, if you look for folks all over the country, uh, we're lucky to have all but one of them uh, right here at UCLA School of Law and one uh, in our uh, sister UC school. Um, I'm going to introduce them briefly now, and then we're going to jump into the discussion. Um, starting uh, right here on my right is Professor Shell Harris, the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Professor of Civil Liberties and Civil Rights at UCLA Law, where she teaches con law, civil rights, employment discrimination, and critical race theory. Uh, Professor Harris is the author of leading works in critical race theory, including the highly influential Whiteness as Property. Uh, more recently, her work has focused on race, equality, and the Constitution uh, through the reexamination of Plessy versus Ferguson uh, and relevant to tonight's discussion, uh, Brother versus Bollinger. Uh, Professor Harris. Uh, next to her is Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, the Distinguished Professor of Law at UCLA School of Law. Uh, Professor Crenshaw teaches civil rights and other courses in critical race studies and constitutional law. Her primary scholarly interests are around race and the law. Um, she was founder and has been a constant uh, intellectual contributor and leader also to the critical race uh, theory movement. Uh, notably, over two, two, decades, two decades ago, she articulated the framework and theory of intersectionality. Uh, Professor Crenshaw. Uh, 
Uh, then next to her is Professor Nijame. Uh, he's professor of law at UC Irvine School of Law, where he teaches in the area of family law, law and sexuality, and constitutional law. Uh, before joining, um, uh, joining there at Irvine, uh, he was associate professor of law at Loyola Law School, and before that, he held the very, very prestigious R. Bradley Sears Law Teaching Fellow uh, here at the Williams Institute. He is also uh, not only a one, but two-time recipient of the Williams Institute's Duke Minnie Award uh, for the best scholarship in sexual orientation law for articles uh, dealing with marriage for same-sex couples. Professor Nijen. I told you they were good. So next to Professor DJ is Professor Angela Riley, also a professor here at UCLA School of Law and director of the UCLA American Indian Study Center. Um, she's, UCLA, she's director of also of our joint degree program in law and American Indian studies. Her research focuses on issues related to indigenous people's rights with a particular emphasis on cultural property and native governance. In 2003, she was, selected, she was selected to serve on her tribe's Supreme Court, becoming the first woman and youngest justice of the Supreme Court of the, of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation of Oklahoma. In 2010, how'd I do? Okay, in 2010, she was elected as its Chief Justice. Professor Riley. And last but not least is Professor Adam Rinkler, also a professor at UCLA School of Law and a specialist in American constitutional law. He teaches con law, professional responsibility, uh, constitutional theory, gun control, and firearms policy. His wide-ranging scholarship has been cited and quoted in landmark Supreme Court cases, including opinions dealing with the Second Amendment and with corporate political speech rights. Along with some other folks here at UCLA Law, he is one of the co-editors of the six-volume Encyclopedia of the American Constitution, and his uh, recent book is Gunfight, the Battle Over the Rights to Bear Arms in America, published in 2011. Professor Winkler. So the organization of our discussion is that uh, the first four speakers will each have uh, 10 minutes to discuss uh, one or two of the cases that are the foundation for tonight's discuss discussion. Professor Rinkler is going to tie it all together uh, for us, uh, uh, identifying some themes and maybe tensions between the cases. We're going to give the panelists a few minutes to respond and then open the discussion up for your questions. Uh, unlike the Supreme Court, we're not going to save the weddings to last, but start with Professor Nijame and the Windsor and Perry cases. So we are starting on a bright note, it seems. Things are going to go downhill from here. Um, I want to thank UCLA uh, School of Law and the Williams Institute, and specifically thank uh, Brad and also Dean Moran for um, including me in this really great event. Um, so I'm here to discuss the, what we've been calling the marriage cases, uh, which is uh, Hollingsworth versus Perry, the challenge to California's Proposition 8, and United States versus Windsor, the challenge to Section 3 of the Federal Defense of Marriage Act. Perry was at every step until the court about the constitutionality of California's uh, state, state marriage ban, um, and yet in the court's decision, we have uh, nothing at all about the question of uh, the constitutionality of state marriage bans. Uh, the court held that Proposition 8 proponents had no standing to appeal the district court's judgment. Uh, this vacated the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals decision, effectively restoring Judge Walker's 2010 district court ruling striking down Proposition 8. Um, as you all know, same-sex couples are once again getting married in California. Uh, Chief Justice Roberts uh, was joined in the majority uh, by Justices Scalia, Ginsburg, Breyer, and Kagan, not what we would expect in a same-sex marriage case. And the dissent was written by Justice Kennedy, who was joined by Justices Thomas, Alito, and Sotomayor. The odd configuration of justices in the Perry case is explained by the fact that the court didn't actually reach the merits. Uh, the justices seemed more concerned with their institutional legitimacy and the potential political reaction to a substantive decision. And so we had justices both supportive of and hostile to same-sex couples' claims to marriage, um, wanting to sidestep the ongoing political and cultural battle. Justice Kennedy would have reached the merits, uh, even though at oral argument it seemed pretty clear that he would have rather uh, avoided the case in the first place. Uh, but once there, uh, he didn't want a ruling that meant that California state officials can effectively uh, veto a citizen initiative by not defending it. 
On the question of same-sex marriage, however, we got no resolution regarding the substantive issues. Uh, nothing on um, the equal protection challenge to state marriage bans, including the constitutionality of separate non-marital designations. Nothing on the level of scrutiny for sexual orientation-based classifications. Nothing on the fundamental right to marry. Uh, remember, this was a suit that was filed um, for the purpose of getting a resolution of those questions um, and to get the Supreme Court to decide it, and uh, they didn't. So to understand more about the substance of same-sex marriage, we have to look to Windsor, uh, which challenged Section 3 of DOMA. Uh, Section 3 uh, provided that the federal government couldn't recognize uh, valid state law marriages of same-sex couples. And the court in Windsor held Section 3 unconstitutional. So now married same-sex couples gain federal recognition and federal rights and benefits. And this generally applies only to couples with valid state law marriages. So if you live in a state that allows you to get married or that recognizes your marriage from another state, you get federal rights. Uh, if you don't, for the most part, with a few exceptions that I'll mention in a moment, you don't get rights. Uh, Justice Kennedy was joined by Justices Ginsburg, Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan in the majority. That was more of the configuration we expected on the substance of same-sex marriage. Uh, and the decision marries federalism, liberty, and equality, um, but at base appears to rest on equal protection grounds. Um, yet, again, the court didn't engage the heightened scrutiny question. So all along, the Justice Department had been arguing that classifications based on sexual orientation uh, should get heightened scrutiny for equal protection purposes, uh, and the Second Circuit Court of Appeals had actually applied heightened scrutiny. Um, but if the Supreme Court took that path, it would have immediately rendered other laws that discriminate against lesbians and gay men, including state marriage bans, uh, constitutionally suspect. Uh, Justice Kennedy didn't even raise the issue. Instead, finding simply that, quote, no legitimate purpose justifies DOMA. This approach is consistent with the institutional considerations that we observed in Perry. Uh, if the court had either applied heightened scrutiny or carefully uh, set out and analyzed and rejected the purported rationales for DOMA, um, it may have been more directly suggesting that state marriage bans are unconstitutional. Okay, so where do these two decisions uh, leave us? Well, uh, first I want us to note that they uh, exacerbate uh, the two Americas that seems to exist for same-sex couples. Uh, we have 13 states plus the District of Columbia uh, with marriage. Um, and these couples now get federal recognition and all the federal rights and benefits that go along with that. Uh, we have six states with comprehensive domestic partnership or civil unions, and one, Wisconsin, with a limited domestic partnership regime. Uh, and as of now, uh, these couples uh, don't get federal recognition. Uh, aside from New Jersey and New Mexico, the states without um, uh, marriage have a constitutional amendment or a statute banning same-sex marriage. Uh, New Mexico is in the center of things right now, is in this odd position of not having a ban, but also not offering relationship recognition. And uh, litigation is pending. Things are happening every day. Yesterday, there was a decision at the trial court level ordering that more marriage licenses be issued to same-sex couples. Um, yet in the majority of states, there are no relationship rights for same-sex couples, uh, no state-based marriage rights, and therefore, no federal rights. It's important to note, however, that there are limited places where the federal law is looking to place of celebration of the marriage rather than place of residence, uh, most importantly on immigration. Uh, and there are indications that we might see additional federal rights and benefits extended to same-sex couples, even if their state doesn't recognize their marriage. Um, we have to wait and see. We might get a place of celebration rule from the IRS actually quite soon, so we're sort of just waiting to see what um, the federal government says. So the big looming question is, what about all the state marriage bans? Uh, are laws restricting marriage at the state level constitutional after Windsor? Well, Chief Justice Roberts wanted to assure us that that question was not being decided. Um, in dissenting, he emphasized the federalism dimensions of the majority opinion in Windsor. Quote, the court does not have before it, and the logic of its opinion does not decide. The distinct question whether the states may continue to utilize the traditional definition of marriage. Justice Scalia, seemingly more honest, disagrees. Quote, the view that this court will take of state prohibition of same-sex marriage is indicated beyond mistaking by today's opinion. So who has the better argument? Uh, well, Justice Scalia's position, I would suggest, is supported by language in Justice Kennedy's opinion, and seemingly every court that has addressed the question since Windsor seems to agree. 
Um, Justice Kennedy noted that the differentiation between same-sex and different-sex couples' marriages, quotes, demeans the couple whose moral and sexual choices the Constitution protects, after Lawrence. And DOMA for Justice Kennedy was at base an attempt to single out and express disapproval of an unpopular minority group, which Justice Kennedy deemed unacceptable under any level of scrutiny. Certainly, state marriage bans fit within this conceptualization. More broadly, though, in Windsor, Justice Kennedy conceptualizes marriage in a way that fits with same-sex couples. Uh, in fact, in dissent, Justice Alito points to the contest over the very meaning of marriage. Uh, if Edie Windsor is right that gender is now irrelevant to marriage, Justice Alito notes, then bans on same-sex marriage look like, quote, rank discrimination. Justice Alito thinks marriage is more about channeling procreative sex into optimal, read, male-female, child-rearing environments, but Justice Kennedy clearly doesn't. Uh, marriage for Justice Kennedy is about adult romantic affiliation, mutual emotional support, financial interdependence, and public recognition and dignity, all equally applicable to same-sex and different-sex couples. Marriage, in Justice Kennedy's eyes, creates a private welfare system by providing rights and obligations that ensure that the couple supports each other and their children. And marriage, in Justice Kennedy's terms, bestows dignity on the couple, making their relationship equal both in the eyes of the state and perhaps more importantly in the eyes of the community. This elaboration of marriage's meaning wasn't necessary to rule in Edie Windsor's favor. She wanted her tax refund. She made merely an equal protection claim, not a claim to the fundamental right to marry. That Justice Kennedy so extensively describes the meaning of marriage and its easy application to same-sex couples suggests that he would have little tolerance for state marriage bans. And his specific focus on dignity and stigma suggests that he would also find non-marital regimes like civil unions and domestic partnerships constitutionally inadequate. Notice in this, though, that there is a strong message about marriage itself. Marriage is the highest status for Justice Kennedy. It marks families as worthy of dignity and respect. The message is not only that same-sex couples should be allowed to marry, but that they should want to marry. So where do we go from here? Uh, well, as you, as you all know, I'm sure there's litigation pending across the country. There was already litigation challenging state marriage bans before Windsor was decided, um, and there's a lot more litigation after. Uh, there's currently more than 20 marriage lawsuits split across federal and state courts um, uh, challenging state marriage bans or lack of recognition. Uh, two of those are right here in the Ninth Circuit, challenging uh, prohibitions in Nevada and Hawaii. And these suits draw explicitly on Justice Kennedy's description of marriage and the comfortable fit of same-sex couples. The lawyers claim, for instance, in Whitewood versus Corbett, the first post-Windsor suit, that same-sex couples, quote, recognize that marriage entails both benefits and obligations on the partners, and they welcome both. And that the exclusion from marriage, quote, demeans and stigmatizes lesbian and gay couples and their children by sending the message that they are less worthy and valued than families headed by opposite sex couples. And courts thus far have reacted favorably, relying on Windsor to rule in plaintiff's favors in, the, in uh, suits challenging state marriage bans. Uh, we're also going to see more initiatives, perhaps, Oregon in 2014, more legislation, including Illinois, Hawaii, and New Jersey. The question is, how long can the court avoid the issue? Uh, clearly, some of the justices, including sympathetic justices to same-sex couples claims, think the issue should keep moving forward without the court settling it. But given all the suits we have, how long can the court actually kick the can down the road? Um, certainly, at the very least, um, by the time the court decides the question, given everything happening in the wake of Windsor and Perry, there will be more states in the marriage equality column, which will likely make the justices uh, more comfortable intervening in this particular area. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Doug, for a wonderful and very economical summary of some remarkably complicated opinions. And to some extent, it actually touches on a theme that I would like to put forward uh, in my presentation on Fisher, which is things are not always what they seem. Mm -hmm. Victories are not always wins. Losses are not always losses, because the terms upon which one side wins or loses often has a lot to do with what happens next. So uh, in Fisher versus Texas, the court, in an opinion authored or written by Justice Kennedy, held that the Fifth Circuit's review of the University of Texas admissions program that included race as a factor 
did not comply with the standard of strict scrutiny review that had been set out by the court in Grutter. Um, the grant then of summary judgment to the university, the court then reversed uh, and said that the university should not have won on those grounds. Kennedy was joined by Roberts, Scalia, Thomas, and Alito, as well as perhaps more interestingly, Sotomayor and Breyer in overruling the lower court's determination that what UT had done was constitutional. It's because in the majority's view, the problem was the incorrect application of the strict scrutiny standard. It reversed and remanded the case to the Fifth Circuit to determine whether UT had offered sufficient evidence to justify its use of race in admissions under the prong of narrow tailoring. Now, Justice Scalia and Thomas filed concurring opinions. One, a perfunctory statement that Grutter was wrongly decided, but since they didn't ask us to overturn it, let's move on. Um, the other was a screed against affirmative action that equated the arguments supporting it with slavery. Guess who? Um, and um, Ginsburg alone dissented, offering her continuing objection to the court's framing of race-conscious public policy as inherently bad, and also contesting what counts as race-conscious policy, an important question to which we will hopefully return. Uh, Kagan did not take any part in the case. So the prevailing understanding of Fisher that came out after the decision was rendered is that conservatives lost, or at least they did not achieve a long anticipated victory in rendering race conscious affirmative action unconstitutional per se. And viewed through the lens of Scalia, Thomas, and Alito, the case was another missed opportunity in fixing equal protection doctrine and rendering this use of race and public policy impermissible. On this view then, liberals won, or at least they dodged the bullet and at least can still hope to craft a race conscious affirmative action policy that will pass constitutional muster, or as one of my students used to say, cut the constitutional muster. Um, so that's a nice, neat narrative, but it really doesn't capture the reality. So for one thing, those who oppose race conscious affirmative action include people who self-identify as political conservatives and political liberals. And this is possible because despite differences over whether race conscious affirmative action is justified, oftentimes people who hold entirely different viewpoints on other issues like the proper role of regulation in the economy or in the environment, uh, they share a view of the racial status quo and racism that sees racism in relatively limited terms. So we all can agree that denial of equal opportunity is a bad thing, but the dominant consensus or what Ian Haney Lopez often calls the racial common sense is that racism lies primarily in the actions of malintentioned, biased individuals. Racism is not defined to include the sedimented racial disadvantage for minorities and the built-in advantages for whites that skew the existing racial status quo. One might even call these advantages preferences if one were to adopt the Proposition 209 definition that a preference is something that gives one group an advantage <coughs> over another. The prevailing understanding of racism then assumes that racism means to take race into account against an otherwise neutral baseline in which every racial group is relatively equally situated or at least is not formally barred to enter. Um, to the extent structural inequality is acknowledged at all, it's largely des described as a function of class. Well, it was not always thus, but to the point, given this definition, of racism, that what it means is to take race into account against an otherwise racially neutral baseline, people who identify as politically opposed on many other issues come together on this one in seeing race-based affirmative action as a racial preference that requires exceptional justification. So treating race as relevant explicitly, as does race-based affirmative action, allegedly then requires extraordinary justification because race is supposed to be, and in fact is, irrelevant Later, if there's time, we can talk about the distinction between ought and is. But in any event, I digress. <laughs> um, so first, what did the court decide? Well, as I said, it's saying that the lower court applied the wrong standard. There was a compelling governmental interest in, that was satisfied by UT's quest for racial diversity. But the lower court had been too deferential to the university's assertion that the plan was narrowly tailored. As the court put it, Quote, the university must prove that the means chosen by it are narrowly tailored to that goal. On this point, the university receives no deference. So what then does narrow tailoring require? According to the majority, the reviewing court must verify that it was necessary to use race to achieve the educational benefits of diversity. It does not, says the court, require exhaustion of every conceivable race-neutral alternative 
but it must satisfy the reviewing court that it really is necessary. So what did the lower courts do that was wrong then? It presumed that the university's reintroduction of race was in good faith and placed the burden of rebutting that presumption on Abigail Fisher. So the court says basically, quote, strict scrutiny must not be strict in theory but fatal in fact, but the opposite is also true. Strict scrutiny must not be strict in theory but feeble in fact. So what had Texas done? What does it now have to do to meet this standard? Um, well, it's, it's too long to go into the history of Texas's admissions policy, but suffice it to say that Texas followed the lead of a lot of selective universities in, uh, after Bakke in adopting a program where race was one of several factors in it making admissions decisions. And it had carried on this way until 1996 when the Fifth Circuit in Hopwood struck that down as unconstitutional. Following Hopwood, the Texas legislature, in an attempt to respond to the drop in black and Latino enrollment, adopted a top 10% plan, which admitted to the top UT campuses all students who finished in the top 10% of their high school graduating class. Well, why would this work in achieving racial diversity? The paradox was because of racial segregation. That is, residential ra racial segregation meant that there were identifiably black and Latino schools across the state of Texas, so that if you admitted the top 10% of those students, you would actually get racial diversity. Uh, this plan was clearly designed to get around the legal ban of Hopwood by adopting a formally race neutral way to increase minority representation. But because it relies on patterns of racial residential segregation, it won't work everywhere and it doesn't work in graduate programs. So by the time we get to the court's decision in Grutter and, Grutter and Gratz in 2003, which basically readopted Bakke's logic, um, Texas then came along and said, okay, so now you're telling us we can take account of race again. Let's take a look and see how. Under the top 10% plan, a majority of black and Latino students, and in fact, a majority of all students were being admitted to Texas through the top 10% plan. Um, but after Grutter, Texas commissioned a study to determine if the educational benefits of diversity were being achieved. And it, they determined that they were not being so at the class level. That is, there were continued feelings and ex continued experiences of minority isolation uh, because there were so few uh, black and Latino students in particular in the smaller classes. Um, in the year that Fisher applied, there were over uh, 20, 29,000 applicants, I believe, about 12,000 admitted, 6,700 accepted and enrolled. And of those, as I said, about 80% were admitted through the Texas Top 10% Plan. There were 216 black and Latino students admitted through holistic review that considered test scores, essays, and race. Uh, the plaintiff, uh, Abigail Fisher, interestingly conceded that race played no role in the admission of about 183 of those 216, and race may or may not have played a factor in the admission of the remainder. So you have Abigail Fisher conceding that the impact of race on admissions was really at the margins, UT was trying to use all race neutral alternatives and only using race where it was absolutely necessary. But now you can see that that might produce its own catch-22 because if it's only operating at the margins affecting such small numbers, how is it really necessary? Um, you also may be uh, aware that Abigail Fisher did not allege that the reason she did not get in was because some other less qualified minority did get in. The reason she didn't make this claim was because she couldn't prove it. Uh, based on her um, criteria, she would not have been admitted. Uh, and note here, though, that the court did not require her to meet that burden of proof, nor did it require her to show any individualized injury. She wasn't suing to overturn Grutter, and she had already attended another school and graduated. So what was she suing to get? Um, her $100 application fee back and an injunction. Her injury that she asserted was that the use of the plan denied equal treatment. I'll save for further discussion some of the other issues that uh, Texas wanted to raise. But the bottom line is, now we have this ruling that says you have to meet this narrow tailoring standard. Is there any deference that is due the institution? Should there be? How can Texas, what is Texas going to have to prove? Well, it's going to have to prove that it needed to use race to achieve the educational benefits of diversity. Uh, fairly prominently during the oral argument, Alito uh, expressed some skepticism about the meaning of criti uh, critical mass. So did Roberts. It's not clear what that standard's going to require. At one level, I think what we have is a move from strict to stricter scrutiny. Uh, and under a narrow tailoring prong, a more and more granular analysis of the facts and the characterizations of those facts. What's necessary? Absolutely necessary. Absolutely positively necessary. 
beyond a reasonable doubt necessary, no other alternative necessary, you get the idea. The result is that while it's possible for UT to meet this difficult to quantify standard, it, if it does, it's a decision that will have less and less precedential value in terms of providing a roadmap to schools that are concerned about achieving the benefits of diversity. In some respects, much of what the court has done here, I would argue, has retained, as it did in the Seattle School District case several um, terms ago, it has retained the shell, in, in, in that case, it retained the shell of Brown while undercutting the possibility of any effective remedy to actually address school segregation at the K-12 level. Um, in this case, I would argue that Fisher has retained the shell of Bruder, but effectively made it more difficult for any school to meet its re-articulated test. Again, things are not always what they seem. Thank you. So uh, picking up where Cheryl uh, left off, so tomorrow will be the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington, and I, for one, don't envy the difficult choice that the first African-American president has to make when he rises to speak to the occasion. I think many bodies will lean forward to hear exactly what he has to say about Shelby versus Holder, the case that invalidated Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act. Now, it's not just the president's identity that makes the challenge so salient. But the fact that his very election also marks the historical event by which the crown jewel of the civil rights movement is now being laid to rest. Some of us older folks will remember those E.F. Hutton commercials where everybody leans in to hear. This is going to be one of those moments tomorrow to see what the president will say about the fate of a law that made this moment possible but likely lives no longer because of it. So this right to non-discrimination in voting is one of those odd guarantees whose explicit constitutional embodiment inspired not so much enforcement, but instead a certain performance of race neutrality in denying that right. So unlike other arenas where white supremacy was once explicitly articulated by law, the denial of the right to vote has always aspired to be both race neutral and deadly effective. The most part, for the most part, until the Voting Rights Act came along uh, in 1965, that strategy was pretty effective. Grandfather clauses, white primaries, literacy tests, poll taxes were only the more well-rehearsed race-neutral strategies that kept African Americans and other people of color from voting. Now, eventually, most of these strategies were struck down, but litigation against each practice was prohibitively expensive, and another policy would quickly take the place of those that were struck down. Now, the Voting Rights Act grabbed the matter by the horns and through a formula known as Section 4, designated that certain covered jurisdictions would no longer exercise a free hand to do whatever they wanted in terms of voting. For covered jurisdictions, Changing, uh, changes in voting procedures would have to be approved by the Department of Justice, which in turn would determine whether the change would discriminate against minorities in the electoral arena. Now, this formula has been reenacted by Congress several times, and this unique structure, shifting the burden to decision makers to prove that a policy does not harm a protected group, created an avenue for advocates to sometimes prevail over officials who wanted to adopt new rules that would effectively suppress the right to vote. Most recently, the act came into play in 2012, where several states' efforts to impose voter ID laws, limit polling hours, and eliminate voting, uh, early voting were barred by the Justice Department. Now, Shelby County, a covered jurisdiction, ineligible for bailout because of its own recent history of vote discrimination, challenged the constitutionality of um, Section 4 as well as Section 5, arguing that the act unfairly singled out some states for onerous burdens when there was no longer a justifiable reason for doing so. Key to the argument was that voting participation of African Americans was no longer disproportionately low as evidenced by the turnout in recent elections, and that areas where participation of African Americans was actually the heaviest were precisely those districts where the Voting Rights Act was in play. Now, of course, this is just as importantly an argument for con the continued need of the Voting Rights Act as it is an argument for its contemporary irrelevance, but I too digress. 
Um, notwithstanding congressional records, voluminous records, of over 15,000 pages of documented incidents of contemporary vote discrimination and suppression, the Supreme Court held that the act denied the integrity and sovereign equality of the states that were covered. This punctuated Justice Scalia's more colorful characterization earlier of the act as a racial entitlement that no one in Congress would ever dare to contest. Now, there's much to be said about the opinion, but I will stick to two points here. One is to highlight how the Roberts Court's signature move in rationalizing the gutting of civil rights infrastructure is to occupy the higher register of racial progress and relegate civil rights advocates to an ugly past. Now, this strategy is almost science fiction-like. It's in the, realm, uh, the vein of an uh, old movie that I used to like, not too old, um, called Face Off, um, in which Nicolas Cage and John Travolta, um, the John Travolta is the good guy, Cage is the bad guy. Cage steals the face of the good guy and remakes himself and John Travolta into the opposite of who they really are. The magic of the Shelby opinion is to stigmatize the Voting Rights Act as static, a slave to history, locked in the past, when in actual fact the brilliance of the Voting Rights Act was the opposite. It did not understand voting discrimination to be locked in the scenes of the Edmund Pettus Bridge where civil rights marchers demanding the right to register to vote were beaten and tear gassed by Alabama police. Congress understood that the will to suppress political participation could find expression not simply in the crack of a police baton, but 50 years later with the insistence that a 98-year-old black woman produce a government-issued ID or that she stand in line for hours, hours longer than she would have to in a white precinct to vote. Although it is Shelby that understands vote discrimination in rigid, reified terms of the past, Justice Roberts is able to work his face-off magic by packaging the Voting Rights Act in the grainy black and white images of the past while the upbeat post-racial future is reflected by the occupants in the White House. Now, the court does not suggest that discrimination is fully a thing of the past. However, it identifies as a greater risk the continuation of measures it claims are disproportionate to the harms they are meant to address. Now, once the muscle man has swung the mallet and the carnival bell has been won, the balance of concern shifts away from the ongoing underrepresentation of people of color throughout American institutions and into the more intangible psychic harms that are suffered by innocents. Now, this logic has traditionally been mobilized to reframe affirmative action through the prism of intangible injuries to innocent individuals. What's new about Shelby is that the court finds a way to extend this empathy to the states. Now, this is part of a larger pattern of the Supreme Court's gradual but deliberate effort to gut the very infrastructure designed to dismantle the institutional vestiges of racial power. Roberts ensures that we can only coast to the promised land by taking the engine out of the vehicle and by painting over the 25 years ahead signposts with, we've arrived, or sort of. So efforts now are underway to amend Section 4, and it is a huge task, although some are optimistic that there are enough votes in Congress to make it happen. Now, exactly what the political calculus is that will deliver a critical mass of Republican representatives to represent the very constraints without which the elections might have turned out differently is somewhat unclear. More broadly is the question of what kind of evidence might be sufficient to sustain a targeted approach. It's difficult to imagine a law in recent history where there was more evidence, more testimony, more deliberation, and more bipartisanship than the Voting Rights Act. Only the five Supremes will know whether there is a tune that Congress can possibly sing that they might dance to. Now, in thinking about what this case might mean for those of you whose interests are a little far afield of equal, equal protection law, one has to grapple with the court's restriction of congressional power to advance two express protections in, in the actual Constitution. For some, this breathtaking power grab further extends the court's right to decide 
the crucial political questions of the day through reference to its own normative vision. How much participation is too little or too much? How much time is enough versus how much is too little? How much should the stigma of being a penalized state weigh against barriers to participation? All of these are questions that were at the heart of the Voting Rights Act and that were decided by Congress. We're now at a point where it's not entirely controversial to assert the essential political character of constitutional law. But then again, there are politics and then there are politics. The Supreme Court once had a political question doctrine that somewhat loosely, never absolutely, precluded the court from overreaching and directly regulating the political process. Bush versus Gore stands out in recent memory as a moment where the court single-handedly determined our political future, Shelby is now another. Perhaps it's time to wonder whether anything is left to contain the court's appetite to remake the political landscape in its own image. Thank you. Well, those are some hard acts to follow, but I will do my best. Um, I want to talk about the baby Veronica case. Uh, in many ways, baby Veronica is really a tragic case for all the parties involved, but really most notably for baby Veronica. Baby Veronica, of course, is not a baby anymore. She's almost four years old. She's a citizen of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma, and she's facing judicially ordered removal from her Indian family through the transfer of custody to adoptive couple, a non-Indian husband and wife in South Carolina who raised Veronica from her birth to the age of two. Since the day he learned of the adoption proceeding, Dustin Brown, her biological father, a member of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma and a soldier on active military duty, has fought for her. He prevailed in South Carolina based on the applicability of the Indian Child Welfare Act of 1978, a federal statute which establishes federal standards for state court child custody proceedings, should I bring this down, involving Indian children, enacted to address abusive child welfare practices that separated Indian children from their families and tribes through adoption or foster care placement, usually in non-Indian homes. At the time that the ICWA was passed, approximately one-third of all Indian children in the United States were being taken from their homes, and 80 to 90 percent of them were being placed in non-Indian homes. The South Carolina Supreme Court found that the ICWA applied to the case, that baby Veronica is an Indian child, that biological father was a parent under the ICWA, that the statute barred the termination of his parental rights, and that had his rights been terminated, ICWA's adoption placement preferences, which are in favor of the tribe and tribal members, would have applied. Since the South Carolina Supreme Court decision two years ago, Dustin Brown, along with his extended Indian family, has raised Veronica. But in June of this year, in a five to four decision written by Justice Alito, joined by Roberts, Kennedy, Thomas, and Breyer, the Supreme Court overturned the South Carolina Supreme Court's ruling, holding ICWA was inapplicable to Veronica's case and remanding the case to South Carolina for further proceedings. So in the next nine minutes, I want to give more background and context on baby Veronica and then provide you a couple of takeaways about this case within the larger context. So I want to start at the beginning. Because this case is so fact intensive, and in fact, the Supreme Court's ruling was so specific to this case, I want to start with the facts. You've probably heard a lot of different views on the facts, so I will try to give the most straightforward summary that I can. Veronica B Brown's biological parents, Christy Maldonado and Dustin Brown, were engaged when the mother became pregnant. The father urged the mother to move up the wedding date so that the child could be born during the, uh, after they were married and could have military health benefits. But their relationship deteriorated and she broke off the engagement via a text message. While still pregnant, she sent another text message to Brown asking if he would rather pay child support or relinquish his parental rights. Brown, who was on active military duty at Fort Sill at the time, responded that he would relinquish his rights in a text message. He later testified that he believed he was relinquishing his rights to the mother. The mother then decided, without informing him, to give the child up for adoption. She testified that she knew Brown was a member of the Cherokee Nation and that his Indian citizenship could potentially be an issue in the adoption. So her attorney contacted the Cherokee Nation to determine whether he was enrolled. 
But what, at this point, it would have triggered the protections of ICWA if he had been enrolled, and the tribe would have gotten involved at that point. But when the letter went to the tribe, his name was misspelled and his birth date was incorrectly reported. And based on this information, the Cherokee Nation could not verify his citizenship in the tribal records. So she worked through a private adoption agency and selected adoptive couple, non-Indians living in South Carolina, to adopt the baby, and they were present at the baby's birth. The adoptive couple initiated adoption proceedings in South Carolina a few days later, and they returned there with baby girl. At no point during this process was Brown, his family, or the Cherokee Nation notified of the pending adoption. So four months after Veronica's birth, days before Brown was set to be deployed to Iraq, he received a notice of the pending adoption. He was served with papers and he signed the documents, which stated that he would not contest the adoption. He again testified later that he did so based on the misunderstanding that they were to relinquish sole custody to the biological mother, a decision he said he believed would ensure his child's security in case he didn't return home from Iraq. Brown testified that when the process server told him that he had just consented to an adoption of his child, he immediately tried to get the papers back, but the process server said he'd face criminal charges if he did. He immediately contacted a lawyer and requested a stay of the adoption proceedings. Around the same time, the Cherokee Nation identified him as a citizen and intervened under ICWA. So the trial, which was delayed while Brown was serving in Iraq, took place in the South Carolina Family Court in September of 2011. By this time, Veronica was two years old. The South Carolina courts found in favor of the biological father under ICWA, and at the age of 27 months, Veronica returned with him to Oklahoma. The adoptive couple filed a petition for cert to the United States Supreme Court to overturn the order. So this past June, in a five to four decision, the Supreme Court reversed and remanded the decision of the South Carolina Supreme Court. They took an extremely narrow reading of ICWA and said essentially that two provisions of ICWA that the South Carolina Supreme Court had relied on in the case um, only applied to the parent of an Indian child who had continued legal or physical custody of the child. So under this reading, the majority held that because Brown had not had custody of his daughter before the adoption proceedings, he was ineligible to invoke the substantive protections of ICWA, which require active efforts be made in an involuntary proceeding and that proof beyond a reasonable doubt of serious harm to this child be shown. In other words, they were not taking a child from an Indian family because she was not with the father. Further, the court held that ICWA statutory placement preferences did not apply because there was no alternative party that had formally sought to adopt the child under ICWA. In her dissenting opinion, Justice Sotomayor, joined in relevant parts by Scalia, Ginsburg, and Kagan, disagreed with the majority's interpretation of ICWA, stating that it thwarted the statute's meaning to exclude non-custodial biological fathers from the act's protections, and that in any case, the question of adoption by, tri by the tribe or by members of the tribe remained open. But following the Supreme Court's opinion, the Supreme Court of South Carolina, by a vote of three to two, ordered that custody should be immediately transferred to the adoptive couple without a best interest of the child test. So immediate attempts by Veronica's family and tribal nation to seek relief from the order to transfer were summarily rejected by South Carolina and by the United States Supreme Courts. So in wrapping up my time, beyond the impact of the court's decision on this one specific case, I want to just give, uh, ra raise three points in closing. So first of all, one thing that has been widely reported in the media that um, merits being addressed in this forum is that although this case is about equality, this case is not about race. In the media and the press and in the Supreme Court's opinion itself, which actually begins with this sentence, this case is about a little girl who is classified as an Indian because she is 1.2% Cherokee. The case has been characterized as being about race. But as Sotomayor notes in her dissent, the case is actually about Indian political sovereignty and nationhood. So if you go into the law library and you look at the US code, 25 US code, the body is entitled Indians. There's an entire section of the code that deals with the relationship between the federal government and Indians. How is this possible in light of the 14th Amendment? How is this tenable? Well, when Europeans came to America, they encountered sovereign tribes. They uh, engaged with them on those grounds through treaties, and this political relationship is one of nationhood. This status remains today. The Cherokee Nation has defined its membership criteria to include Dustin Brown and his Indian family, including baby Veronica. So to the Cherokee Nation, she is not a mixed-race Indian. She is a Cherokee citizen. 
And secondly, let me explain why, from an Indian law perspective, this case was not as devastating as it might have been. Petitioners attempted throughout the litigation to challenge ICWA as constituting an unfair racial preference in violation of equal protection. This idea was not accepted by the majority, but was strongly hinted at in Justice Clarence Thomas's concurrence. So though the US Constitution contemplates the existence of Indian nations in several respects, it actually doesn't constitutionalize Indian rights. Indian tribes are pre-constitutional. Their political identity and sovereignty predate the formation of the United States, and they've never been formally brought within the Constitution. So because of this unique and anomalous political history, federal Indian law, constitutionally, historically, and jurisprudentially, is characterized by exceptionalism. A rejection of that unique history by the court and a move towards decontextualized formal equality could potentially implode the field of Indian law and take tribal sovereignty and Indian cultural survival down with it. Thankfully, that didn't happen in this case. And finally, what happened to baby Veronica? Well, in July, following the Supreme Court decision, Brown and his wife actually filed an action in Oklahoma State Court to adopt baby Veronica and also filed a lawsuit in South Carolina to force the court to engage in a best interest of the child inquiry. Baby Veronica's grandparents were granted temporary guardianship by the Cherokee Nation District Court, while Brown completes 30 days mand mandatory National Guard service training. When Veronica's father didn't comply with a South Carolina order to relinquish his daughter, an arrest warrant was issued, and he was charged with custodial interference under South Carolina law. South Carolina seeks extradition of Dustin Brown from Oklahoma to face criminal prosecution. So baby Veronica is still in the custody of her Indian family in Oklahoma in an undisclosed location. The adoptive couple are in Oklahoma now, seeking her return, and the parties are reportedly in a mediation, but at an impasse. Baby Veronica now has her own lawyer, appointed by the Cherokee Nation. And if you found any of this interesting, my federal Indian law class doesn't start till the end of September, and there's very much wrong. Thanks. Uh, that was a, a terrific presentation. Thank you so much um, uh, for our organizers, and especially uh, to all of you for coming out, uh, and to Cindy for her wonderful gift for uh, uh, Wither the Court and its future. Um, Brad asked me to talk a little bit about the Roberts Court and its approach to equality, um, looking at it from a, with a larger lens rather than particular cases, larger trends. Uh, and this is an incredibly difficult uh, task because there is no one Roberts Court. What there are are many Roberts Courts, uh, perhaps we should say many Kennedy Courts because Justice Kennedy is really the swing justice on this court. And indeed, if one looks through the equality decisions that come up in a variety of areas, especially the areas we've talked about already, uh, from race, uh, sexual orientation, um, uh, native uh, tribes uh, and their rights. Uh, we find uh, that it's a mixed bag often, that the court, based on shifting uh, coalitions, will reach different results that have different effects on equality. So there's really not just one Roberts Court. There are multiple Roberts Courts. Nonetheless, we might point out a few uh, trends, commonalities that we see patterns repeating uh, over and over again. Uh, one of the most prominent of these patterns is the reliance on formal equality. Uh, the idea that the court has uh, that people should be treated uh, exactly the same by the government, uh, and that government intervention into the marketplace uh, to promote the idea of equality often runs afoul of this principle of formal equality. Uh, because government intervention ends up treating someone differently than someone else. The equality that the Roberts Court generally tries to pursue and to seek is an equality in the marketplace, uh, an equality that allows everyone to compete uh, uh, equally. Uh, and if they don't succeed in the marketplace, well, they can't really complain about that. That's not the government's fault. Um, and one particularly a uh, common reflection or illustration of this idea uh, is the court's reluctance to allow the courts uh, to be an active voice in protecting minority rights. Um, the court has very narrowly read civil rights laws from across the spectrum, from age to women's rights uh, uh, and in other areas, to reduce the ability of people to seek redress 
for discrimination in the federal courts. Um, we also see that um, the court seems, uh, in many cases, more interested in stepping in and protecting people from claims of discrimination when those people are part of majoritarian groups rather than parts of minority groups. Um, now, I want to think about these trends uh, and, and actually broaden the discussion beyond race uh, and uh, sexual orientation uh, and uh, uh, American Indians uh, and focus on uh, some of the cases that have been decided in recent years in other areas that profoundly affect uh, equality in this larger lens. I want to start with what I think is one of the most important decisions relating to equality, but is one that does not deal with race uh, or sexual orientation or any identity category uh, whatsoever. Or I should say, perhaps, it's a new identity category. And that's the Citizens United case, Federal Election Commission, uh, Citizens United against Federal Election Commission. This was the 2010 Supreme Court decision where the court set, uh, struck down limits on corporations and unions from financing electioneering communications. And basically, the end result of the Citizens United decision is to allow corporations to spend uh, unlimited amounts of money uh, to promote uh, the candidacies uh, of uh, people running for elective office. Unions are similarly empowered, uh, and unions have taken advantage uh, of this Citizens United ruling. Uh, but uh, anyone who knows this field knows that in the long run, uh, unions will be uh, small players compared to the resources that American business corporations uh, can leverage for electoral uh, opportunities. Now, key to this uh, Citizens United case was a rejection of the idea of government intervention to promote equality. In fact, the Supreme Court went out of its way to uh, emphasize that equalizing political voices has no place in our constitutional system, that equality uh, of, in politics is not a constitutionally permissible value, in fact, that the only value in electoral politics is liberty. Uh, and the Supreme Court uh, says that uh, efforts to try to cabin the voice of corporations because they might drown out other voices are constitutionally impermissible. We also see in the electoral process uh, people who are seeking uh, equality uh, but find it hard to reach because of a lack of resources um, uh, hurt by other decisions that the court has made in the campaign finance uh, and electoral process area. One good example would be a case that will be of relevance in coming years as we continue to debate and consider voter ID laws. A few years ago, in a case called Crawford against Marion County, uh, the Supreme Court held that uh, laws requiring voters to prove uh, their identification are constitutionally permissible. This despite the fact uh, that uh, it's widely known that these laws are harder to comply uh, for people who don't have, uh, much, uh, don't have uh, very much in the way of economic resources. Harder to get the IDs, much less likely to get the IDs, uh, and the poor are disproportionately adversely affected by voter ID laws. Nonetheless, the court has said these laws are constitutionally permissible, and, and we've seen a spate of these laws uh, come about in the last couple of years. In addition to wealth, one area that is a traditional identity category, and maybe uh, uh, wealth uh, is an identity category in some senses, at least corporate identities become a, 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 an issue where people can uh, assert constitutional rights because of their corporate identity. Uh, we'll also see, uh, we've also seen developments in the area of women's rights, a traditional area uh, that we're concerned about in discrimination. Uh, but uh, we're, there were no big cases this particular term. But we've seen a long pattern in the Supreme Court uh, under the Roberts, uh, uh, under the Chief Justiceship of John Roberts, of limiting women's access to the courts to pursue discrimination claims. Uh, a couple years ago, there was a well-known case, Walmart uh, against Dukes, that made it harder to bring class action suits claiming discrimination on the basis of sex. Uh, the court has uh, uh, also, in a well-known case called Ledbetter against Goodyear Tire, uh, made it harder for women uh, to bring sex discrimination claims uh, when they did not know about this, the uh, unwarranted discrimination against them earlier on in their careers. The Ledbetter case has been overturned by federal law. Walmart against Dukes has not. 
Uh, and the court has also ruled in the women's rights area dealing with abortion, broadening the ability of lawmakers to restrict abortion uh, and thus making it harder for women to exercise that particular constitutional right. We've also seen the court uh, take uh, the mixed bag that is the court's uh, equality rulings uh, and its interest in protecting majoritarian um, uh, groups more than minority groups, uh, especially prominent in the area of religious liberty. Uh, while the court has issued important decisions expanding the right of majoritarian religions, uh, including two years ago the Hosanna Tabor versus EEOC case, a case that held uh, that uh, uh, the ministerial ex exemption from discrimination laws uh, should be broadly, constru broadly construed to protect not just priests at religious institutions, but people involved in religious instruction as well. Decision that helps majoritarian religions, um, uh, like the majority on the Supreme Court. There's a majority of Catholics on the current Supreme Court, uh, that being a religion that was helped uh, particularly by that decision. Um, uh, but when it comes to religious minorities, we've seen less uh, solicitous approach by the Supreme Court. In Hine against freedom uh, uh, from religion, uh, religious dissenters were held to lack standing to challenge federal faith-based initiatives. In Arizona Christian schools against Wynn, the court once again held that there was no standing to challenge tax credits uh, that went to contribute to religious institutions contrast these tight rulings when it comes to questions of, st of standing with the Fisher case that we've already talked about. Um, uh, uh, but um, uh, nonetheless, while some of these other areas warrant some discussion, um, I think ultimately our conversations about equality in the Roberts Court will always be judged in reference to how the court approaches questions of race. Well, we've already talked about how the court uh, uh, dealt with race in this current term with the Fisher and the Shelby County case. I want to suggest that um, how, how that we perhaps start to think about the Roberts Court in broader historical terms, too. How might historians 50 years from now look back at this term in the Supreme Court and the Roberts Court approach to issues of racial discrimination? I think it's very telling when historians will look at the big markers, things like Obama's uh, election and then re-election, as important moments for uh, the uh, advancement of equality on the basis of race in America. But they'll also couple the, those uh, elections with the Voting Rights Act and the courts uh, uh, striking down of Section 4 of that Voting Rights Act. And in some ways, you could see how what's happening right now might well be viewed in 20 or 30 years' times as a, a key turning point, where we uh, found, we reached the end of the Brown civil rights era, at least when it came to race. Now, if there's a dark, uh, if this is a dark cloud for those who are seeking to promote uh, uh, and protect minority rights, perhaps there is a potential silver lining. Uh, the silver lining would be that, that these decisions will force uh, people who support minority rights to really focus on political activism rather than litigation as a means of protecting their rights and protecting their interests. Um, and in truth, uh, the court over the course of its history has rarely been a voice for protecting minority rights. We may be fooled by the Brown era that we lived through in the, that 40-year period in the middle of the 20th century uh, where the court was more vigorously protecting minority rights. It might actually only be about a 20-year period. But anyone who studies the history of the Supreme Court will know that it's more like 200 years of ruling in favor of majorities uh, and relative hostility to minorities. Uh, so focusing on political organization might be an advantage. However, even here, uh, the silver lining is tarnished. Uh, this term, by striking down the Voting Rights Act, the Supreme Court has basically made it clear that it will stand in the way of political organization if it achieves goals like the Voting Rights Act uh, that violate the court's view of formal equality. Um, but that political activism may nonetheless force us all to focus on changing the membership of the institution that we are here to discuss. For when we ask the question, whither the court? The answer uh, depends on us. What is the court that we are willing to fight for and to seek and to organize to achieve? Uh, and that is the question the Roberts Court asks us. Thank you very much. Respond to each other or to Evan's comments. <laughs> mm. <laughs> 
<laughs> I was thinking, Adam, when you were talking about um, how history can judge this court, um, that I've often wondered why were people thinking what was the state of mind when the court decided the civil rights cases in 1883 and Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896, which stand as sort of markers of another low point in the protection of minorities, the sort of very constrained interpretation of the powers of Congress to address inequality. And um, I, I ask myself this question because I think that in some respects, you're absolutely right that to think of the court as sort of a protector of minority rights is maybe to delude oneself and ignore the majority of that history. Um, and I think what I take away from that is that the struggle to go from Plessy to Brown uh, took many decades, but it was also a struggle that, as you've suggested, to some ways went back uh, to the ground in some respects. That is to say, it had to look not to the court for protection, but had to actually look in terms of what people could do um, politically in a in in a day to day level to address uh, a system that was hostile uh, to their interests. And so I I don't necessarily take that as you know a happy story, but what I I do take away from that is that we have maybe seen this moment before, uh, and um, have. Um, live to see its transformation. So, um, but, but I, I do often wonder, uh, you know, like when the court decided Plessy in 1896, what was it like to see the door shutting, mm -hmm. right? And um, to some extent, I, I think we may be facing similar questions, particularly because the avenues of political redress are limited both by Citizens United, as you've described, and now um, Shelby County. Mm -hmm. Well, since I, Pushed you into things. <laughs> 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 I feel like I have to. I know. <laughs> um, so I, I, I'll build on that and, and worry a little bit and also pull another historical moment that feels um, salient to me as well. And, and, and that would be the Lochner moment where um, uh, efforts on the part of working people, unions, to create legislative interventions to address exploitation um, were limited by a Supreme Court view about what the natural distribution of rights and entitlements would be, and efforts to change that distribution were seen as violating you know, their sense of, of what the Constitution required. Um, there, there are ways in which this moment feels like that across the board, um, that there's a natural distribution of entitlement that is associated with gender, that's associated with race, that's associated with class, that's associated with corporate speech. Um, and the, the typical claim, if you can't get it through the court and go to the legislature, is now no longer as available as it might have been in the past. So my sense is that it, it, it might be an opportunity for a new conversation, because it tends to be the case that when that fictive option was available, people would often resort to, well, we just have to get more organized. We, we have to uh, make the messages better. We have to um, really flex some muscle and go back to Congress and go back to the state. Well, in a lot of these moments, there's no going back anywhere. It, it's hard to figure out what the workaround is going to be for us, uh, you know, Section 4. It's hard to figure out what the fix is. But what I don't see yet is the kind of conversation that I think we would need to have as um, you suggested, Adam, to really rethink um, how we think about the court and how we think about its importance and how we think about making the constitution of the court an, a political issue. And for a whole range of reasons, people are very uncomfortable talking about the court as a politicized institution, um, which is space I think the court has been able to occupy to do a lot of political things. So I, I'm actually interested in whether this is a new moment for us that takes us to a new kind of conversation, um, at least among those constituents who see the fortunes of their particular uh, rights actually taking uh, quite a dive. Um, I, 
I just want to say I think that there's a, uh, in some ways, the marriage cases could be presented as uh, not analogous or not fitting into this context. Yeah, I think they actually do. So, um, right. So part of what's happening in Windsor and um, and the court actually letting Perry stand, which is also a big deal, um, is an it is a formal equality move, and it speaks to the point in in which the uh, LGBT mobilization is at at the time it approaches the court. So we could uh, certainly um, uh, look at what we get in Windsor a decade ago, what we get in Lawrence, uh, and before that, in the mid 1980s, what we get in Bowers versus Hardwick, where the court finds the claim that same sex couples or that gay and lesbian people have any claim to equality um, or liberty um, to be facetious and to not have a relationship to family and relationships and privacy and all the things that now are clearly part of that. And so um, so I do think that the, uh, the equality moves of the court when we talk about lesbian and gay rights probably runs out of steam after a particular moment. But I also think this particular marriage question and the way it gets framed by the court also fits within this context because it, it's part of the same, I think, um, uh, non-interventionist state um, neoliberal politics that sees um, a lot of what's happening is privatizing support and dependency within families and basically propping up the um, now same-sex couple-headed families as in some ways um, uh, uh, almost now the aspirational model of the family. Gay and lesbian couples are actually supporting one another, um, making sure that their obligations are within that private family, supporting the children they have without marriage, actually. They're sort of already subjects that are willingly um, disciplining themselves and asking for marriage recognition. And I think the claim does not have to be framed that way by the court, and yet Justice Kennedy is clearly very open to that particular understanding of marriage, which skirts questions about substantive equality and also questions about the state's role in supporting families and dependency relationships. I'll be brief because I want to really hear the questions of the audience, but I guess I just had a couple of thoughts. I mean, one is sort of my overriding sense um, that that the court doesn't really lead, but that it follows. And I think what it what worries me about some of these cases is the extent to which the court is reflecting either what it believes to be or what is the changing views of the society um, and the way people in the country feel about these various issues. Um, in some cases, more po that's a more positive reflection, in my view, than others. Um, and I say that even though, in some sense, Baby Girl is kind of an outlier, because the case is 5-4. Um, there's a strong dissent. Uh, Scalia himself dissents in the case, presumably, we think, because of the father's rights issue, most strongly. Um, so people are kind of all over the place on that case. Um, but all of that is to say that I sort of wonder, particularly in my own field, if that majority opinion um, by Alito sort of reflecting in particular what they see as um, diminishing blood quantum of American Indians um, somehow will begin to undermine the field altogether and that the political sovereignty of Indian people and Indian peoples um, will no longer be legitimate um, once people no longer adhere to pre-modern lifestyles, um, which increasingly we're seeing with movement off of the reservation um, native languages dying out, et cetera. So it's sort of an interesting time um, to kind of see how it's all playing out in the court. But I'll stop and, um, and let other people talk. OK, with th that, um, let's open it up to your questions. Um, I think we're going to have a couple of folks. Hamid um, has a microphone. So if you want to find Hamid, or Hamid will find you, uh, we'll start with the question. confused about the message um, that we're talking about here because um, the court is highly politicized and it is um, not protecting the rights of minorities and yet I don't see how we can influence the court. Um, as Professor Crenshaw pointed out, with Citizens United we have less chance of, of um, organizing and having some sort of grassroots response that's going to take hold. And so when you talk about, uh, you know, we've got to change the court or we have to change how we view the court or we have to admit that they're politicized, that doesn't help because they're still there and Judge Roberts is young. 
and most of them are either, <laughs> and most of them are either young or they're just staying till they die, which is what which actually Judge Ginsburg just said that, which I guess is good. But um, but in other words, I'm not seeing a solution. It's just making me feel um, more hopeless about the situation. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to take several, or we should we? Yeah, let's get a couple of questions. Someone else have a question? Our timekeeper. Does. You're allowed. Right? Uh, if, if you were to uh, talk about the, the boxer kind of in under the Lochner idea and under the notion that you can't escape, it seems to me that Perry is contrary to this notion. And Perry is contrary to the notion because it nullifies uh, the political thing. You have to allow the political system to make a mistake. And it seems to me that Perry devalues the vote in a different way uh, than, say, the Voting Rights Act decision uh, devalues the vote. And to me, the, the theme that's similar here is that the political system is easier to correct. If the people of this state make a mistake, we can remedy that mistake later. And what we've done here what in Perry is to nullify the voice of the people in, in a good cause, admittedly, we all think. But still, we've devalued the process and, as a consequence, I think, devalued the vote. Let's take one more, Gregory, and then we'll get responses. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Winkler, something you mentioned that kind of uh, struck my mind was about how a lot of these cases don't seem to, to make sense as a whole. Um, and so my question for each of the panel members was about how federalism kind of cuts through all of these cases. Um, the court seems to have a lot of respect for state legislators in, the, in respecting by dancing around the issue um, uh, states, ch states' rights and choosing who can get married and who can't. And in, states, and in the court um, kind of adhering to what states do when it comes to who can vote and who can't. But when it comes to the University of Texas or the South Carolina Supreme Court, the, the Supreme Court doesn't seem to have a lot of patience for those actors. So I just, I want to know how, how in, in terms of how Roberts Court addresses equality, where does you know, state level actors play into this calculus? Um, well, it's a great, it's a great, uh, great set of questions. I uh, don't know that I can, uh, certainly, I certainly won't even try to address uh, all of them, but at least let me start with um, the hopeless. Is it hopeless? Um, <laughs> of course it's hopeless. Um, no, um, um, no, I don't think it's hopeless. Uh, you know, uh, Anton Scalia is 76 years old. <laughs> Anthony Kennedy is, I think, 77 years old. Um, voting matters. Voting for the president matters. Um, and it doesn't mean you vote for the president, you're going to get exactly the justices you want, you get exactly the rulings you want. Um, but it matters, and it makes a big difference. And political organizing, um, you know, Citizens United was, is an important case, and it's going to deeply and profoundly affect our politics for many, many years to come, because it's not going to be overturned by a constitutional amendment or by this court in, in the near future. Um, but nonetheless, you know, you can still um, vote, and you can still organize, and you can still elect the right president, uh, uh, depending on whatever your political views are. Um, it's about replacing those justices. Uh, you know, I'm one of those people who thinks that Ruth Bader Ginsburg can do us all and her legacy a great favor by stepping down um, and taking that vote uh, and securing it for the next 35 years in a Democratic nominee, uh, a Democratic appointment. Uh, I hope Ruth Bader Ginsburg lives to 120, um, but she's taking a big chance. She had this big interview in the New York Times this past weekend where she said, oh, I'm sure the next president will be fine. Well, I'm not so sure of that, and, and I don't know why she's so optimistic, but, uh, you know, uh, I'm hopeful, but I'm hopeful in that uh, the people can make changes, and I think what's happening in the field of gay rights is an important uh, marker, too, uh, that we're taking some steps backward, I think, on the issue of race. I think we're taking some step backwards in terms of women's rights. We're taking some steps forward in some other areas, uh, sexual orientation being an important one, and those are important steps to take forward. Uh, so I don't think it's about being hopeless, but it's about mixing 
uh, a hope uh, with a profound sense of realism uh, and recognizing that things can be accomplished, but it's not going to happen just because we file a lawsuit. Well, um, so 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 I'll sign on to to most of of that encouragement for us not to be hopeless, um, with with just a couple caveats because. Um, Obviously, you know, um, this isn't going to change in the short run. This is not a transactional, you know, conversation. It's longer term transformational, which I would feel a little bit more confident about if I thought that there was an ongoing active conversation about the constitution of the court and how it shapes our lives on, on the side of the aisle that wants to see the court transformed. Frankly, I just don't see much of a conversation about it. Um, if we think back on the uh, presidential debates that happened last year, there was very little conversation um, about the Supreme Court. Very, very, very little. I think a lot of folks who, you know, were disillusioned by by the first uh, four years, you know, were able to rally themselves with the idea that, well, it's the court, it's the court, it's the court. But people were kind of telling themselves that. Um, it, it wasn't really uh, coming from more organized uh, spaces. Um, and I think that's just kind of symptomatic of the fact that there really isn't um, a deep understanding of how the Supreme Court in particular, but how courts in general actually function in society. People don't really have, I think, a sense that these are the rule makers. They're the ones that determine how and whether you have access to you know, the political process to actually pursue your objectives. It, it, they, that, that's the place that determines what states can do and, and what federal governments can do and stand in the way if they do something that they don't like or allow them to do something that they do want to. So, so my, my concern is that in part, sometimes the celebration of when the court does the right thing sort of encourages uh, uh, an inevitability thesis, the, the idea that eventually you know, justice will prevail. And we don't of, often tell the really complicated and nuanced stories about how some of the cases came about, um, what are the factors that might have gone one way or the other, what it means across the board on a lot of different other issues. We're just not, as a people, I think, as literate as we can and should be about Supreme Court politics. So I'd feel a lot better about this possibility if the pressure was being placed on this administration to be as aggressive in seeing that its visions of uh, law and equality were being expressed through its appointments as the prior presidents have been. I actually just want to say that that's the point of departure that I really think is kind of interesting because if you can, if you take a look at this Supreme Court, this is not just the Supreme Court we're talking about. We're talking about the entire federal court system, mm -hmm. which has over the last 40 years really been transformed in terms of its focus, its viewpoint, and that has been the product of a very concerted effort on the part of conservative activists to change the court, and they have been very successful in doing so. So I guess I would just drop a footnote here to say is some people understand this very well. Um, and some people, um, the problem has been in that responding to it, I think um, uh, people who have differing political views, liberal, pro progressive, however you want to characterize them, have felt disabled in responding to it because it's, the, the charge is you're politicizing the court. Mm -hmm. um, when in fact the court has been and historically has always been seen as a place where sort of political ideas are, are uh, expressed um, through various doctrinal frameworks and otherwise. I, I'm not saying that to say that law is simply a, re a reduction of politics. I do think that there are, in fact, doctrinal frameworks that matter. Um, I think there are laws that matter. What I'm trying to say, however, is that this perception that um, it, it seems to be actually one-sided that the court is not important. For um, conservative activists, the court's been crucially important mm -hmm. um, and has been targeted as an arena in which to exert political pressure. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention in response to the comments about Perry and sort of the devaluation of, of the vote in a certain sense, um, I guess I find that really an interesting comment in part because of one case that's coming up on the court's uh, term next term this is uh, Schwett versus the Coalition to Defend Affirmative Action. This is a case coming out of Michigan 
where there was a challenge to, uh, so after Grutter, Michigan passed a provision very similar to Proposition 209 here in California, banning uh, race conscious affirmative action in governmental hiring and in admissions. And there's been a challenge to that under the political restructuring doctrine, which is a branch of the Equal Protection Clause that basically says certain kinds of political activities that are effectuated to the democratic, through the democratic vote can, in effect, violate equal protection. That is, the fact that it takes place through a popular vote doesn't insulate it from equal protection analysis. Now, this is an old line of cases going back, um, I guess, about 30 years. Somebody help me here. Um, and um, I, I can't. <laughs> um, and it basically looking at um, situations where the popular vote through initiatives, through propositions, was used to um, restrict access to certain kinds of remedies for anti-discrimination law. And of course, Romer versus Evans, a case that we haven't mentioned today, um, but which has great significance in terms of it marking the Supreme Court's um, moving in a different direction with reference to uh, LGBT rights, was one in which the court was limiting effectively the democratic vote. So I guess I want to say that um, it, it, the democratic vote is both a mechanism for achieving equality and can oftentimes be a mechanism for taking it away. And one of the challenges that we have is often trying to figure out what is the appropriate framework for addressing that. Do people want to respond to Gregory's question about kind of how federalism informs a number of these cases? <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I don't know if I can tie all the cases together, um, but just in speaking for the for the baby Veronica case, it was curious because I do think that there was a sense among some Indian law scholars that um, Indian affairs are are exclusively the prerogative of the federal government. Um, because of the relationship of tribes within the US system, the federal government has, and Congress has plenary power over Indian affairs. So there was a sense that even the very conservative, most conservative justices in the baby Veronica case would be ready and willing, willing and very excited um, to uphold ICWA in the face of what was essentially um, a challenge that the state law conception of fatherhood um, should apply in that case. And so the, the issues of federalism didn't work out there exactly the way that we suspected that they would. And I think there were just other kinds of political and other concerns. I mean, the whole opinion really, the opinion and the lengthy dissent read as statutory interpretation um, opinions. They really don't engage very much with the broader questions, except to the extent that you have these little hints, like Alito's comment, et cetera. Um, so in, they're, they're exceedingly narrow. But um, I think there was a sense that um, the federalism would dictate that case, and it sort of got turned on its head, curiously. Certainly in Windsor, after oral argument, we thought that Justice Kennedy was thinking entirely in terms of federalism. Um, and it was remarkable then that the opinion uh, touched on federalism and talked about, but used that as a way to talk about um, how unique DOMA actually was and that then we could better discern that its purpose was to single out um, same-sex couples. Uh, and so Justice Kennedy goes out of his way to talk about the fact that while there are federalism problems here, um, uh, when we talk about marriage laws, uh, we still wouldn't allow the state to actually construct marriage in a way that runs afoul of um, our federal equal protection principles and then cites loving. Um, so I think it's important to keep in mind that um, we actually thought, a lot of people thought that Justice Kennedy was going to go down this federalism route um, and not embrace the equality dimensions that he actually did. Um, I just want to echo some of the things that uh, Kim and Cheryl were saying about um, the, the way in which we think about the court and its role in mobilizations. Um, because a lot of our discussion is proceeding from uh, a, a sympathetic posture to left mobilizations. And we need to acknowledge, as we just did, that the court is the product of mobilizations on the right that have actually been very successful, um, not only in getting um, uh, movement members and sympathizers into positions on the Supreme Court and the lower federal courts, um, but also in articulating a vision of constitutional interpretation and adjudication um, uh, and making it seem as if it's not a political project. Uh, and so, um, and so we, we've sort of, I, I feel like a lot of the um, uh, critiques on the left of courts have actually um, 
been sort of explanatory theories about courts that make wholesale claims, as the right is actually taking a much more nuanced and um, a politically sophisticated view of courts. Um, and I actually think the LGBT movement has done that quite well. Um, the fact that they uh, started uh, the same-sex marriage campaign in state courts, in particular states, based on the relationship between the um, court and the constitutional amendment process, right? So lawyers didn't want to bring litigation in California precisely because of what happened, um, and understood where they had um, uh, people in political places that were sympathetic to the cause, worked hard to insulate victories from political reversal, um, and really have managed the courts in a way that I think is very much uh, consistent with how the right has managed the courts. Uh, and so if we think about the courts not only as political, but also as part of um, a broader story about political mobilizations, I think we actually approach the courts in a much more contextualized way without having um, that, that would push us away from sort of a wholesale turn away from the courts and towards political mobilization as if that's something different. Great. Well, we're just about out of time. Um, and so uh, I think I want to wrap up the panel there and invite you to join the discussion across the courtyard at the law school. But so we don't end on a note uh, of hopelessness about the court. I want to go back to the beginning of the discussion, actually, Dean Moran's introduction, that uh, mobilization is one way uh, to impact uh, the court in these decisions. And all the ways uh, that you heard that the panelists, that students at UCLA School of Law impacted the development of the law, although not always in victories, um, from Professor Riley's uh, speech. Uh, you heard how great she must have been then uh, when you heard her speak today, uh, providing some historical context for the baby Veronica case, uh, the briefs that students worked on in the Supreme Court seminar, um, and all of the research, the thinking, uh, the insights of these folks uh, that do reach the minds uh, and hearts of some judges. So for all of you just starting out here at UCLA School of Law, we look forward uh, to joining you uh, in this conversation and in this work, uh, most immediately across the courtyard uh, for the reception. So thank you. Thank you.